Hi, so um, today I'm going to do something a little bit different than we've done in the past. Um, we are going to cover the TC39 meeting. So if it's your first time uh, watching this stream, the purpose of this stream is to sort of see how we can better communicate what we do uh, at TC39 and also on the SpiderMonkey team, how the JavaScript specification, which is this massive document of over a thousand pages, gets turned into a JavaScript engine, like SpiderMonkey. Um, and uh, last stream uh, that we had, which was a week ago on Friday, we covered the implementation aspect and we'll be primarily focusing in this series on implementation and web compatibility but in this one because it's a little bit special uh, we're going to be a bit more interactive and we're going to uh, well i'm going to cover the things that i thought were interesting at the last tc39 meeting now uh, tc39 has an agenda that's published before every single meeting which you can find at uh, github and tc39 slash agendas oops that takes us to the wrong spot sorry um and uh this is essentially the thing that dictates what the meeting is going to be about and yeah, we're going to look at it and we're going to discuss why certain uh, things went through, why certain things didn't go through, different types of uh, decisions that were come to during the process of the agenda. And I posted the agenda in the chat if you want to go and take a look at it. Maybe there's something specific that you want to discuss in this stream and I want to see how that goes. So this is going to be like a fireside chat where you can say, oh, I'm interested in this particular proposal. Can you tell me more about it? We can talk more about it or uh, we can talk about how a specific discussion went or we can talk about a question about how the process works. Everything is possible. That's what this space is for. So please feel free to do that. I'm super excited to introduce more people to how this process works. Before we dig into the process, I want to show you the process document. This is the thing that uh, describes our staging process, like how a proposal goes from an idea to a part of the specification and implemented in multiple browsers and other types of vendors. And this document, it's a little hard to read. Uh, we've discussed making it a little bit easier to read. It's uh, basically this table describing each of the stages. Um, so, if you've ever heard of a proposal going to stage one or stage two, or maybe you've seen in Babel, uh, in a, uh, there used to be a setting in Babel that enabled stages, uh, everything from stage three, I think that's been removed since. Um, each one of these stages sort of describes the maturity of a, propo of a proposal. It doesn't necessarily mean that something will become a part of JavaScript. It just means it's under consideration. We're working through all of the details of what's going to happen. So uh, let's say you, uh, the people watching, um, have an idea for something to add to JavaScript. Uh, that's called a straw, man pro straw person proposal. And there's no entry requirement for that. Uh, but what you need to do during that time is sort of like figure out what's the problem you're trying to solve. How is this going to impact developers? Uh, who, who's the audience for that? Who's struggling with this problem that you've identified and want to fix? Then step, step stage one is uh, to make something an official proposal, which is basically telling the committee that you're doing this work. And it's pretty rare that something is stopped from reaching stage one. It does happen, uh, usually in the case that a problem has been discussed before. That did happen at the most recent TC39 meeting. Um, or that the uh, proposed solution isn't realistic. So that's another type of place where a stage zero to one proposal might get stuck. Uh, then the next step is stage two. This is where the committee says, yes, we agree with the problem that you've described and we're interested in figuring out how to solve it. This has certain uh, requirements that need to be fulfilled. You'll notice here that there is entrance criteria for each stage. So stage one, you need to find a champion. You need to propose, the out, uh, propose a general outline of the problem, et cetera, et cetera. Then in step two, you need to have an initial spec text, which we looked at in the last stream, and we'll look at some more spec text today. Um, we also want 
to start talking about deeper problems that could arise from the spec. Maybe implementers will get involved at this point. It depends on the complexity of the proposal. Stage three is sort of, uh, this is the point where implementers start really thinking about a proposal and probably implementing it and giving feedback about, oh, this proposed solution, this set of behavior actually won't work because of yada, yada, yada. So this is the kind of feedback you'll get at stage three. And then stage four is finished. A couple of things, uh, finished means it's part of the published spec and it gets released in March uh, when we, well, not released in March. Uh, we do the cutoff, I think, in March and then we eventually like have the ECMA General Assembly say, yes, this is the actual TC, um, ECMA, two, uh, sorry, uh, ECMA script or ECMA 262 specification for a given year. Lots of people in the chat are also uh, going to be able to answer lots of uh, questions here. So, but yeah, I see we've got a couple of uh, regulars at TC39 also in the chat. So they might also pop in with a few answers if you've got questions. Please feel free to just ask anything while I'm talking. So the process of TC39, incidentally, TC39 stands for Technical Committee 39. We are the 39th committee of ECMA. Uh, there are several others. I don't remember any of the numbers off the top of my head, but we do have an IOT a TC, Technical Committee, and we uh, there is also the Technical Committee for, I believe, CDs and MP3s, if I remember correctly. Uh, and you can see all of that on the ECMA website. Now. These, uh, this process, the way that it works is we meet uh, six times a year, every two months, and we discuss whether or not a proposal should move forward in the process. And these meetings take, they used to take three days, but since the situation with, um, with uh, the pandemic, we've moved to being completely remote, and as a result, we've adjusted our schedule to be remote friendly. It's a, a four-day meeting now, that's five hours each day, and we discuss whatever is in the backlog for that day and just add our items to the agenda. The meeting is restricted to members, uh, which is defined as members of ECMA, uh, and members are actually companies, not individuals, and companies can send delegates, such as myself. I'm a TC39 delegate for Mozilla. Uh, there are also invited experts who are invited to comment on or present proposals. And uh, yeah, I'm just thinking if there's anything else to cover. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the process and, what, and the document we're about to take a look at? All right, I'll let people think if they've got any questions and I'm going to come back in like maybe a minute and answer any, any questions that might build up from that. Okay, so. Um, process advancement only happens at committee. That happens six times a year, and uh, it's through these four stages. Also important, the four stages are not a linear progression. If something has reached, for example, stage three, it does not mean for certain that um, uh, it does not mean for certain that it will proceed to stage four. It could actually be taken back a stage, and that has happened in the past as well. That didn't happen at this meeting, though. Okay, let's take a look at the agenda and the structure of the agenda and the stuff that was covered. And I'll very quickly summarize um, the proposals that were uh, described at this meeting. So, straw person, oh great, we've got a question. Uh, I wanted to know more about the straw person to st uh, stage zero failures. Right, so it can happen and I think the best way to illustrate this is with an example. Uh, and it did happen at this uh, recent meeting. Um, so you'll notice, uh, I'll just show quickly the, the structure of the agenda. We uh, structure the, uh, the progression of the agenda by specific types of topics. At the beginning, we have lots of bureaucratic stuff that we cover, like updates from the editors if there's significant editorial changes to specifications. Also, TC39 handles not only ECMA 262, the JavaScript specification, they also cover ECMA 402, which is the internationalization library for JavaScript. And they cover ECMA 404, which I believe is the JSON specification. And then there's one more, which is the actual structure of the spec itself. Uh, we also have a test suite, which in our last stream we looked at. We looked at a failing test on SpiderMonkey, 
and uh, we looked at how to fix it. The PR just went up. I will share that with you as well so you can take a look at precisely the details of that fix, uh, especially when we pick it up again at the next uh, stream on Friday. Uh, we also have a COC, a Code of Conduct Committee, which you can read more about how our Code of Conduct Committee works and the members uh, who are participating there, along with how we enforce the Code of Conduct, frequently asked questions, etc. Uh, frequently asked questions, etc. Uh, this Code of Conduct also applies to the TC39 proposal repositories. Okay, cool. So, um, number 13 is the golden part of the agenda where a lot of our time is spent uh, and uh, here are where a lot of the proposals are being put up from uh, to progress from stage three in this case uh, this first one is three uh, up to stage four or whatever their next stage is now uh, someone asked what happens when something fails to go from stage zero to stage one uh, for what reason might that happen? And the one that I'm looking for is generic comparison. Now this has already been updated. Uh, this is a, a new proposal for uh, doing generic equality. Uh, and it, it initially comes from comparing arrays. So maybe you as a developer have experienced trying to compare, for example, let's, let's just take a look at an example. Um, uh, I have an intro. Uh, let's say you want to do, and this this document that I'm editing will be published. Uh, let's say you have an array, and you have a second array, and you want to check uh, that these two are equal. And this is actually pretty hard in JavaScript. This isn't super simple. Like, let's say you've got a couple of numbers, and they're all in the same order. And you would have to, oops, uh, you would have to manually check each one of these elements to see if these two arrays are equal. And the goal of this proposal was to make this easier, and it got rejected. And the question might be like, well, that's that seems like a pretty good problem to solve. Array comparison in JavaScript isn't the funnest thing. Uh, why did it get rejected? Uh, also, what's great about the agenda document is you can see all of the presentations that we look at when we discuss these uh, proposals. So here we can actually click on the slides and we get the proposal that was made for this, uh, for this item in the agenda. And they, they highlight the specific issues uh, that I just raised about array comparison. So like creating an equals method, etc. But it gets a little bit more complex when they get to this slide. And then they say, uh, one second, it's going to come here, this slide. You'll notice that they are trying to introduce a new type of operator which allows generic equality. And uh, I also got a little bit lost at this point because what this operator does is it gives you back a number. It gives you a minus one, a zero, or a positive one. And also detail of uh, JavaScript, um, we have negative zero and positive zero for reasons. There are reasons. I don't fully understand them. <laughs> but uh, basically, they wanted to introduce a generic equality that would allow equality between any kinds of values. Uh, here's an example, and I'm just going to present this one so that you can see it a little bit. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, no. Um, can I hide this? Oh, OK. Uh, essentially, this example is showing you uh, comparing days, like yesterday and tomorrow, and what type of equality that gives back. Now, this proposal was criticized for doing something that is very difficult to actually do in a deterministic way and in a way that actually works across the board the way that you would expect. So it was, and also introducing the, the operator that was proposed with the less than equals greater than symbol wasn't exactly the most exciting thing in terms of uh, implementation. And it was just a really large proposal that was far more than what the proposal was actually trying to solve, which is array quality. So it got scaled back. And what ended up happening is we went ahead and re reconfigured the proposal and said, okay, let's just focus on that problem of array quality and bring that to stage one, because that's a problem that we can clearly define. Generic equality is difficult to, to define because we're trying to do equality between everything. Uh, 
we've kind of seen similar things before go wrong. Uh, so let's focus on this thing that we understand the problem about and uh, let's fix that. So that's, that's why that proposal, that specific proposal was rejected from stage one, but modified and then accepted as stage one. We did have another one that was completely rejected from stage one, but the reason was rather complicated. Yes, that's the spaceship operator. Uh, the reason was rather complicated, so I won't dig too much into that, but I think that, tip of, that describes the uh, reason for that being rejected. Okay. Uh, Please feel free to keep asking questions. I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible. So, Also, there are people in the chat who know about this uh, and uh, will also be able to catch any, any uh, 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 things that I don't manage to, to get. Okay, cool. Uh, so, uh, coming back to this list, uh, what we see here, if we just read the agenda is we have a number of things that are for stage X. In this case, this is for stage four. Uh, we also have for stage three here, Intel Segmenter, uh, and uh, we have several updates. Just going through this really quickly. Uh, String.prototype.replaceAll. This first one is introducing a new method on string that would allow you to do replace all instead of uh, this weird G flag that you add to regex and actually have it always replace everything because this was an ambiguous thing. Logical assignment. Uh, logical assignment, we're going to look into more depth. This introduces a new. Um, Ooh, the word is escaping me, binary operator, that uh, new assignment operator actually. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, doing plus equals to uh, increments, uh, to add something to a given value, like, uh, well, let's do an example. Um, let's go over here. So what I'm talking about is uh, looking at something like this. So a plus equals two, and if a is, uh, a equals three, and then A will be five. Uh, what, what the logical assignment um, proposal does is it introduces this for logical operators such as uh, A or equals one. So if, uh, let's say, B is undefined, and now B will be assigned to one, for example. Okay, moving on. Um, Promise.any is also another nice to have uh, method. Uh, it's another, it's a, um, it's, it's similar to promise.race or promise.all. Promise.any resolves if anything, uh, if anything is settled. Um, next, we have the decorators status update. If you are familiar with TypeScript or anything that uses decorators, you probably know what this is. Um, the way that it's being implemented in JavaScript, again, for some complex implementer reasons, is probably not uh, what you would expect if you've used decorators elsewhere, uh, but uh, we can dig into that if people have questions. Um, Intel.segmentator, this is how uh, lines get segmented when you write text and display text. Um, the proposal is good overall, uh, but it, there is another rule in TC39, and I'm just going to scroll up and show it to you. We have uh, agenda topic rules. Yes, uh, decorators are the at symbol. So agenda topic rules, we have a deadline for advancement, and if you miss it, people may uh, be very upset with you and uh, say that it can't be, uh, that your proposal can't move forward because it wasn't added by the date for advancement. I am one of those people because I actually review all of the proposals with the Spider Monkey team, and in order to do that, they have to be online. <laughs> and if they're not online, then I can't review them with the team. I can review them myself, but uh, the Spider Monkey engine is actually pretty large, and I'm pretty new to the team, so we need to be able to review it as a group. Um, yeah, and you can read the agenda rules, all that information is public. So, but Okay, so I simplified it a bit. Uh, segmentator, uh, segmenter wasn't blocked just because of that. There were a couple of other issues. Each, uh, each stage in the process has uh, sort of um, exp like a set of requirements, like the, uh, the spec has to be at a certain quality. And for stage three, 
Um, you actually need, I don't think we've actually got this written down. Ooh. Uh, you need to have people who have signed off. You need to have a couple of reviewers who have read, yeah, who have read your proposal uh, deeply, understood it, looked at any problems that might occur, and then said, yeah, it's good to go. And it was missing one reviewer, and there was another issue which we can get into that is quite interesting. It affected several of the proposals in this uh, meeting around security and whether or not a uh, specific I don't want to say feature because it sounds like it's a specific aspect of the proposal would make it um, more likely to be problematic from a security standpoint or from an integrity standpoint, which is another way to look at that question. Um, okay, moving along. Uh, iterator helpers are things like, you know what, uh, well, I'll just give you an example again trying to always give examples. Um, iterator helpers is something we're actually already experimenting with. Uh, we've got somebody working on it right now. Uh, but you know how you've got, uh, let's say you've got some array equals some array, and you want to uh, map over that and multiply all the values by two. Uh, then you can do array.map, and then you can do x, x times two. And that would be enough for, for you to iterate over everything in the array and then return a new array that's times two. But uh, let's say you have some kind of a generator. Um, star, uh, let's call this foo, because I'm really bad at naming things. And uh, let's say it always yields one, for example. And uh, you want to map over the results from that generator. But at the moment, you wouldn't be able to do uh, bar x equals foo and then x dot map. Uh, just to finish the example. You wouldn't be able to do that right now. And the iterator helpers proposal introduces a whole slew of uh, methods that you might be familiar with from array, uh, but now apply to iterator objects and uh, iterators are something that generators return. Okay, carrying on. Um, temporal. So temporal is a library to deal with calendars and dates and the date time object in the proper way. Date time is actually pretty bad in JavaScript and we're trying to fix it uh, and they've been doing a great job digging through all of the problems that come up with times and calendars and everything. Uh, it's a big proposal. I haven't had a chance to look at it in depth because it's so big but it's finally stabilizing and uh, you will be able to test a polyfill. That's what they announced at this meeting that there's a polyfill that you can take a look at and uh, test that's going to be public very soon. Uh, function implementation hiding we're going to look at in detail. Realms, uh, this is another integrity related proposal. So JavaScript has this concept of realms. Realms are um, sort of the spec language for the global, uh, the global object that you have in your uh, program. And uh, what Realms is, is it's trying to make it possible for you to create that object without um, a DOM window attached to it. So at the moment, from the perspective of a programmer, you can create iframes, but you can't create the global object by itself without the DOM. And this proposal is seeking to do that. Uh, number format is... Do I remember this correctly? I hope I remember this correctly. Number format is basically um, translating between different types of number, number formats, for example, kilometers and miles, kilograms and, uh, kilograms and pounds, etc. Ergonomic brand checks. We can look into this one in more depth. Um, so a brand check is sort of spec ease, like TC39 language for knowing for sure that an object is what it says it is. So you might be familiar in JavaScript of something called type of. Um, so brand checks Ooh. and check. 
uh, let's say you have um, class X and then Y instance of X. So uh, this, this might be the way that you would think of checking if an object is the th is of the thing uh, is of the type that you think it is, but this can be this can be faked because of uh, because of the nature of JavaScript. So uh, in TC39, when we talk about brand checks, we're talking about how can we be certain that this thing that is telling us that it is an array is actually an array. And uh, incidentally, uh, the vocabulary of TC39, we're working on publishing it. So if I say something that it's like, oh my god, I don't know what that is, like you're not sure what it is, um, you can actually uh, open a pull request in how we work. So TC39 slash how we work is our repository for telling you how we work. <laughs> and we have a glossary here. Uh, terminology. So here is the definition for brand check, and I'll link this in the notes that I'm writing as I talk. Uh, and uh, there is a detailed example here of also the issues around this. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second and just say, if you've got questions while I'm talking, feel free to put them into the chat, and I'll start answering them as I go through this list before we go over to uh, the three proposals that I've highlighted for discussing in depth. And if you've got a specific proposal that you see on the uh, agenda list, let me know, and I can look at that one in depth as well. OK, moving back to the agenda. This was a really long meeting. We actually didn't get through everything, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, internationalization duration format. Uh, I believe this was minutes, seconds, milliseconds, and things like this, if I remember correctly. Uh, record and tuple update. Records and tuples, if you've used immutable JS, in your projects, record and tuple are trying to implement immutable JS. There are specific restrictions around doing this, um, and we're finding our way through. It's in stage one, and yeah, uh, that was an update. Also, there's there's a distinction between updates and stage advancements. Sometimes a champion. Um, also, we have different positions for people working on the proposals. There are authors and there are champions. An author can be anyone, just someone who has an idea. A champion is someone who comes from a member organization as a delegate and is making sure that the proposal moves through the stages. So if you uh, are thinking of something and you're like, I would really love to see this in JavaScript, you would find a champion who would make sure that your proposal made it through the process. Things do get blocked. Uh, in TC39, we don't have a concept of rejecting a proposal. We only really have a concept of blocking a proposal. Maybe that block is insurmountable. Maybe that block is surmountable. Right, so records and tuples uh, were an update, just sort of showing uh, where they are in terms of their work. They're at stage one right now, working through several problems, and they're getting feedback from the committee uh, in order to figure out what the best path forward is. Do expressions. Uh, I'm looking at this line now. Do expressions are, and again, I will do an example because that'll be easier to understand. So, um, oh, I've got a question. How do you prioritize in SpiderMonkey what to implement first, assuming some make it through at the same time? Um, so, uh, we look at the scope and the scale of the proposal and how likely it is to impact. Um, so there's a couple of things we look at. We look at complexity. We look at the impact on developer lives and how likely it is to help developers. Um, we look at um, whether or not we're behind with other implementations. That does happen also. And I think those are sort of the main driving things that lead our decisions. So some proposals are really easy to implement. They're like maybe a couple of lines, and you can knock it out in half a day. And uh, let's say you're stuck on some proposal and thinking like, oh my god, I haven't done anything for a week. I would really love to be productive. You might pick up a proposal and be like, OK, I'm just going to check this one off and, uh, and, and implement it. 
And then there's other proposals. For example, uh, right now I'm working on top level of weight, and if I can manage to get it through, we might look at a summary of how implementing top level of weight looked. That's a bigger proposal that's much more difficult to implement, but it's also very, uh, very much improving the lives of developers. So we want to get that in sooner rather than later. Another issue is uh, that sometimes. Um, a polyfill might be in place, for example, Babel, that might lighten the load and make it not a crucial thing that we implement it right away because that behavior is possible to achieve in a different way. So we balance several things and uh, we try to be as up to date to the, uh, with the spec as possible. Sometimes that's not possible. Uh, sometimes we, re re we rely on polyfills, but generally we try to do that. And then finally, uh, if something is easy, but nobody's really focused on it, then if it's a high developer priority, then um, we make sure it gets in. So, um, right, we were looking at do uh, expressions. So I don't know if uh, you're familiar with uh, something that looks like this. Um, do why? Mm -hmm. Just thinking of some bad e example, uh, and then let's say we do that while x is less than 3. So this is a do while expression. Uh, this exists in JavaScript. What we have here is this uh, do notation. And what's proposed is that we sort of take that and we let you do something like this. And this can become very useful if you say if x is less than 3, else uh, if you do something like this. Now, you might be familiar with this pattern. Uh, you might have seen it some, you, you might have seen it in a slightly different way. Like, for example, um, Let's say you have y, let y equal false or something. I didn't think of this example very much. And then you do y equals false, y equals true. And th this is a little bit like, um, you might be familiar with this pattern where you say let and then the variable name and then uh, if some condition do this, if some other condition do that other thing, uh, then what do expressions will do for you is they will allow you to avoid that and instead follow this pattern. What's important here is that you'll notice that there isn't anything like return here. We're just putting false uh, as the expression at the end of that if statement. This relies on completion values and this is controversial for some members of the committee. Uh, do expressions actually couldn't advance to stage two at this meeting because they didn't have the spec text. So uh, that resulted in them not being able to move forward, but I'm looking forward to them bringing that back to committee in the next, uh, in the next meeting. Whew. <laughs> this is so many things to cover. We're going to narrow our focus in a minute. Okay, uh, module attributes. Um, this allows you to specify the type of the module that you're in, that you're bringing in. So right now, modules are sort of all assumed to be JavaScript. But what if you wanted to bring in JSON? So you would be able to say import X from whatever uh, as JSON. That's the very short version of what that is. Um, Built-in modules. This one right here. Oh my goodness! I've didn't switch my stream, sorry. Uh, we were looking at uh, module attributes. Uh, now we are looking at built-in modules. So built-in modules is basically introducing a standard library to JavaScript, so not everything is on the global object. However, everything will still be in the JS namespace. So it'll introduce a JS namespace where things like uh, temporal and other types of library things can go into. Um, okay, arbitrary uh, module namespace names. I actually don't fully understand what the goal of this proposal was, but uh, we can take a look here at the at the example. 
Okay, so here's the example. Uh, allow arbitrary strings as names. So you can export something as hello world and import something as nice to meet you. I'm not really sure how this is going to work. I didn't fully understand what the motivation here is and there wasn't a proposal repository to take a look at. But I believe that this was going for... Uh, it wasn't even going for stage advancement. Lots of people are having issues with this sound. I'm going to try and... Uh, reduce my stuff more. Hopefully that'll help. Okay. Um, right. So, um, where was I? I'm not. I, I don't fully understand uh, arbitrary module namespace names, but it wasn't asking for stage advancement, so there. There wasn't too much to say. It was sort of an idea here. Take a look at an idea. What do you think? Um, I actually skipped Intel enumeration. I forget what that was about. You can definitely check it out. <laughs> um, okay, next. Deep path property records, record literals, was about, again, records and tuples, which we discussed earlier as a... Um, oh, uh, mentioned during plenary that arbitrary namespace, uh, module namespace names would be useful for languages that compile to WebAssembly with more expressive identifiers and export syntax. So rabid pancakes, if you've got questions about that one, you should definitely talk to them and they'll be able to give you a complete picture on why that is what it is. I didn't fully get it, but what I just read in the chat actually makes a lot of sense and I'm gonna look into that a bit more deeply. Uh, when, it, when it comes to stage zero proposals, sometimes there isn't enough time for me to review everything fully, so this is my bad. Sorry, Bradley. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, deep path properties in record literals. We talked about tuples, but I didn't show them, so I'm going to show you what records and tuples look like. Um, So for example, you might have a record that looks like this, and records can only take primitive values. And uh, let's say that you want to modify the record in some way. For example, uh, not modify the record. The records themselves are immutable, but let's say you want to duplicate that record and you want to transfer all of its properties except for one. And you might know this pattern from doing immutable style JavaScript. So let's say we've got Y. I forget the exact syntax here, uh, but this is apparently possible. So. This is not very deeply nested, uh, but let's say you want to do And then you want to modify that C property on Y. What you would normally do is, is like recreate that thing. And what this proposal is suggesting is instead of doing that, uh, to support modifying things in, that are deeply nested. So instead you would have Yes, there are a lot of hashes. I keep mistyping that. And you would be able to do y.c and that's that's the change. Now, I personally uh, I can see the uh, the appeal to this because I have definitely had situations where uh, I needed to modify a deeply nested property in a thing that should be basically uh, sharing a structure with previous iterations of that object. But at the same time, I'm a little bit worried about this because I could see this potentially um, causing people to make more errors. And uh, that's the thing that makes me suspicious about this proposal, but I'm curious to see where they take this going forward. Again, this, is, uh, this was a stage zero proposal going to stage one. Records and tuples themselves haven't been fully um, 
moved through the entire process. So I'm curious about what's going to happen with this one. I also didn't have a chance to fully review the smart unit preferences in uh, the number format proposal, so I'm going to skip over that one. I did review symbol as weak map keys, but I forgot already uh, the details here. I believe this is again related to record and tuple, uh, specifically to allow equality between two different records, but I'm a little bit fuzzy on it. I don't think we got to from import unless I completely zoned out. Monocle mustache operator. Yes. What about the monocle mustache operator? Um, so if I remember correctly, it looked something like this. Um, let me see if I can find that. I don't think I spelled that right. So, by the way, if you didn't know, we've got this repository called TC39 Proposals. Everything's on GitHub, by the way. And you can find any proposals that you might be interested in that have been presented at TC39 uh, if you want to do some investigation about what's happened before. It's not everything. We have maybe the last five to eight years, I think, of proposals. It's not everything, but it is a substantial amount. So if you want to do a bit of research to see what's happened in the past, this is a good place to start. And I don't remember, was it here? No. So there was another operator proposed, which was the monocle mustache operator, but I forget the details of that proposal, so I can't speak to it. And someone uh, just uh, posted the link to it in the chat, definitely check that out. But yes, there is another counter proposal to deeply nested um, properties. Okay, we covered generic comparison. Async context is another one that didn't reach stage one, uh, which is this one here. The reason for it not reaching stage one is that it was trying to solve a problem that had been brought to TC39 before, and uh, it didn't solve a problem with that thing that was brought up before. Uh, specifically, it was around dynamic scoping. This will be published in the notes, uh, and you can read about what happened there. And we have two last proposals. Uh, one of them is item. So um, again, moving back to the programming side of things. Um, let's, say, uh, let's say you've got an array and you want to access the last element, you would probably do array.length minus one. The idea from this proposal is sort of like, wouldn't it be great if you could do just array and then do minus one and get like uh, the thing related to it? But we can't do that. That's impossible because of how JavaScript works. So the idea is you would be able to do dot item and uh, you could put negative numbers in here. Uh, so you would uh, get a relative element to the length of the array. I'm not too sure how that works with last. There is another proposal that wasn't raised, that wasn't brought for stage advancement in this meeting, which was array.last. Um, but there is also another proposal, array.last, which might be renamed because it's not um, web compatible. But yeah, so this was proposed for stage one. It uh, achieved stage one, I believe, and that's it for that one. Um, moving back to the spec. And the last one is something I presented along with Shu from Google, which is restricting subclassing support. This is something that is very much an implementation question for the most part, but it does impact developers because it impacts to what degree you can do subclassing. Uh, we can also talk about that one, but it would probably take up a full hour. So uh, yeah, okay. Do people have questions? <laughs> Okay, I will let everyone come up with questions. And while they do that, I'm going to highlight and go into detail on a couple of those proposals that we just looked at. So the first one is uh, logical assignment. Oops. Or is it? I thought it was logical assignment. Yes, it is. 
Okay, um, so one of the things that happens is we have uh, updates that come through the, through the committee meetings. And those updates are trying to get consensus on a direction for a proposal. Oh, someone just asked, uh, subclassing like in Java. Mm. I'm not very familiar with Java myself. Um, the goal of restricting subclasses in JavaScript would be to uh, limit the expressiveness of the language, actually. Subclassing in JavaScript is actually pretty advanced. You can do a lot with it. You can really really control with a fine-grained precision what you uh, what you do in that subclass. Okay, let's take a look at it. I'm, I'm going to do a super fast version of it. <laughs> okay. Um, so there is this repository, and there's reasons we want to do this. Now, minimal subclassing support means that when you do new A. Uh, and you're extending from an array. This is only true for built-ins. So for example, if you subclass from your own objects, uh, the behavior is uh, consistent with what you would expect. But if you, sub if you extend array and we don't have minimal support for subclassing, instead of returning an A object here, you would get back an array, which is what you see here. And we want to keep that, probably, because it's not going to be web compatible to remove that. Type 2 subclassing means that when you extend from array and you call a method on array, such as from or map, the object that is returned is again of that type, of type A instead of array. Then, this is where it gets like totally amazing that you can do this, uh, we have this thing called species. So this is a lookup that happens when you subclass um, to check if the thing is of a certain species. So like here I have class A, from is returning, because from is a static method, from is returning an object of type A. But let's say, you know, uh, if, you, if you work with the DOM a lot uh, and you have a node list, a node list, it returns stuff of type node list, but maybe you want it to actually return stuff of type array. Using species, it's possible to do that. It's very costly. Uh, the performance improvements of this are very brittle. So if you do anything strange, it might not turn out as well as you hope. Um, and this is potentially going to be really, uh, this is something that is not great from the specs perspective or from the implementer's perspective. Anyway, <laughs> um, and then type four is you can override what the methods do, like exec, overriding exec in regex. Hardly anybody does it. We actually didn't find any examples of anybody doing it. and. Uh, it's not really recommended anyway, and this means that all of our performance stuff has to sort of guard against this stuff. We need to check that uh, we need to create fast paths and slow paths, things that fully implement the spec, things that don't fully implement the spec. This is why we want to pull back this support. We've done some... Um, I wasn't expecting to talk about this. So I'm not doing a very good job. I'm sorry. Um, so. We did, uh, Bradley, who's also in the, uh, in the chat, um, did a really fantastic job sort of just taking a look at what people are doing uh, by scraping uh, sections, I think it was about a thousand pages, and seeing how uh, subclassing works and what people do. There's a lot more research to be done. We want to make sure that if we do remove this, it's web compatible. Um, and if it's not, we won't be able to do this change. But if it is, it could be a really big benefit for both uh, engine implementers who could simplify their implementations and make things more consistently performant and more secure. And it'll be better for spec writers because they will be able to do things in a, um, in a nicer way in the spec. They won't have to take in, into consideration species every single time that they're writing the specification. And it 
could be better also for developers because they can rely on their engines much more. And uh, yeah, that's basically the motivation there. <laughs> oh, sorry, Rabbit Pancakes. I thought you might be Bradley. It looks like Bradley's not in the chat. Uh, you mentioned stuff about the um, about the uh, module attribute names, and I thought that might be you, but very good. <laughs> okay. Um, Going back to the logical assignment, I'm sorry for everyone who is losing my audio. I will try to figure out what's going on there uh, and see if I can make that better. Okay, cool. So let's talk about logical assignment and the status update that they made. Actually, I'm gonna go back to the spec for that. Uh, and we can read the issue and we can see what changed. So, Oh, no, not this one. Uh, named evaluation. I am running out of time. I wasn't expecting this to take so long. Okay, so the issue is being raised by uh, Jay Ridgewell, and he's also a delegate to TC39. What we have here is we're discussing what makes the most sense for the uh, for how this proposal will work. What's the best way to express the mental model for people? Now, let's say you've got foo uh, knowledge coalescing operator equals function. Should the function now have the name foo? And uh, the issue here is basically in how developers will picture what this does. And Michael Ficarra, again, a delegate, sort of summed it up really, really well. And he says, this only makes sense if you think of rewriting a knowledge coalescing assignment equals to B as A knowledge coalesces with A equals B instead of A equals A knowledge coalescing B. And that's sort of the, uh, that's sort of the crux of the issue. And uh, this came to committee, we discussed it, we talked about the pros and cons of these two different mental models going forward, and we decided that actually let's, uh, the expectation is probably going to be that the function is named. So that's what we went with. And that's already been implemented in Firefox. Okay, that didn't take very long. <laughs> The next thing that I had on my list of things to discuss is uh, looking more in depth on Unicode support. So we just looked at how something gets updated. And incidentally, uh, if you go to that proposal and uh, click here, um, I didn't do a walkthrough of the proposals. I should have done that. So everything that's a proposal usually has its spec text rendered. So here's an example of that spec text for logical assignment operators rendered. And you can uh, see uh, here in green the stuff that this proposal adds to the spec. So we're adding a logical assignment puncture and we're de defining logical assignment puncture as one of these three operators. And uh, you can also see how um, left-hand side expression and assignment expression is being modified here. So here is the definition, the syntax definition for an assignment expression. Uh, and uh, here is uh, how that comes out. Um, yeah, and the change uh, to the specification, we can pull up the, uh, the pull request. which should have been closed just recently. Um, actually, I'll get it from the issue. Named evaluation. And here we are. So this is the change to the specification uh, that uh, that was done. So you can review how it changed, how the specification changed from what it used to be to what it is now, and how we're now doing named evaluation of the assignment expression. 
Now, people, uh, someone's mentioning that they disagree with the, the expectation. I'm not too sure if, uh, which one of the two expectations, but we do have those kind of discussions about what is the most likely uh, mental model for a given thing. Uh, and uh, and there's, there's some interesting points there about why it might not make sense. Um, one thing that's different between the, uh, for example, the compound assignment operators like plus equals, minus equals, etc., is that they're performing a very different kind of operation. It's not checking for null or undefined. It's checking for, uh, sorry, they're not checking for null or undefined. They're checking for uh, things that are a value. So there is some argumentation there, definitely something that can be discussed uh, in the proposal and people can uh, give in more detail why the decision was made as it was. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, and we're getting low on time, so I might actually even not talk about it and just open up the floor for discussion. I wanted to talk about this item here, which is Unicode support. So uh, I wanted to tell you about how specs layer with one another, because JavaScript actually doesn't specify the encoding that it's encoded with. We use Unicode, which is another specification. And what I wanted to show is how that other specification gets pulled in to our specification. Would folks be interested in taking the last couple of minutes we've got to talk about that, or do you want to ask some questions? I'm just gonna give it a minute, see what people have to say. Yes, we have one yes, so I'm going to go with that. Unicode, yeah, okay, so I don't know anything about Unicode. <laughs> Unicode is terrifying to me. Um, okay, Unicode is... Uh, okay, <laughs> we're doing it. Uh, how do specifications interact? Now, the slides that Michael did here are really, really great. Uh, oh, there's some great questions. People, you know, just keep asking questions. I'm going to come to them after I finish describing what happened with Unicode. So just throw your questions into the chat and I'll get to them. Okay, so Unicode support, um, way back in July 2016, we decided that we were going to pull, uh, we were just going to normatively reference Unicode. And in fact, we can see that in the specification. ECMA 262. Unicode. Oh, was it that one? Yeah, so a conforming implementation of ECMAScript must interpret source text input in conformance with the latest version of Unicode standard and ISO IEC that number. Uh, so that's basically saying like just take the latest Unicode standard and use that. But as this proposal shows, this is a more complicated question. Specifically, we have a series of tables, table 55, let me see if I can find it. Okay, so for example, in table 55, we restrict the property aliases from Unicode. We don't want to use all of them. So that means that we have to have a, an allow list of which Unicode properties we want to use. So this discussion was around how should we do that? How should we determine um, which things from Unicode to pull into our standard and which ones should we say like, mm, we don't want to do that. And the discussion is really interesting because it shows uh, certain points in which specs interact. So um, Unicode might add in their next implementation 900 properties and suddenly all implementations of JavaScript would have to support all those 900 things without necessarily um, considering how that impacts the JavaScript spec. So what we want to do is make sure that there's a, limited, a limitation to this power. Uh, and the proposal here was to add a piece of prose. Specifically, uh, it says normatively describe the process for deriving the information currently in tables 55, 56, and 57 uh, from a Unicode dataset. 
the issue in this discussion was around the word normative because uh, normative means that it has an impact, like it has an impact on the behavior of the specification. And uh, the people who objected said, okay, everything that you're proposing sounds pretty good, minus the normative part. We don't want to have that there. And that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. The, it. It's basically like, we don't want to be beholden to another specification that makes changes that we don't have control over. We want to make sure we keep control over certain things with regards to property access, regex, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's how we did it, by making sure that it's not normative. So uh, I had a question in the chat about has class, uh, private class field standard been discussed? Not at this meeting. Uh, that's currently being implemented and getting feedback from implementers. Uh, all right, okay, so we're a couple of minutes over the allotted one hour, but fortunately I don't have another meeting to run to. Um, so I'm just gonna open up the floor and ask, do people have questions? Do they have things that they wanna discuss? I also want to point uh, towards my suggestion box. This is the second stream that I've done, so I'm far from perfect and I'm happy to improve. There have been some technical difficulties. Uh, please let me know how I can do this better. And if you find this topic interesting, maybe this wasn't as interesting as the previous stream where I talked about how to implement stuff. Maybe it was more interesting. I would love to hear from you. Um, so yeah, and I'm going to give it like two minutes and then I'm going to kill the stream. It's going to be over. So get your questions in. For now, I'll just sit here and drink water. Why not fix Unicode to some version and live with it? Um, I think, uh, so I'm not an expert on Unicode, but uh, the issue as I understand it is as Unicode changes the, uh, I think Unicode might not have, uh, nah. okay, other things implement Unicode fully, um, but uh, if we say like you have to use Unicode 10, and maybe something backwards incompatible or something significant changes and we're the only standard that doesn't uh, that doesn't implement that new Unicode, then it's going to be a little bit weird and th things are going to start aging. So we want to stay up to date with the latest version. Um, JavaScript developers want to stuff more features into the language than C++ has. Hmm. Well, I'm, you know, it's interesting because JavaScript is this really fascinating language, right? It's super accessible and uh, it's not something that was built for, like the mandate that was given to Brendan I when he decided, when he designed JavaScript in 10 days was um, make something that non-professional programmers have an easy time with. And then there's 10 days and then non-professional programmers and we end up with something that's not entirely perfect, but everyone can pick up. And that means that people are like, oh, I've discovered uh, this type of thing. I've discovered that type of thing. And lots of stuff gets pulled in. So that's one thing that I think makes JavaScript, the fact that JavaScript is so absorbent and it can do so many different types of code styles, it makes people sort of want to push it in certain directions. The other thing is JavaScript, at least at the moment, is the only language for the web unless you compile to JavaScript. And uh, that means that people are restricted in terms of what they can use. So they want JavaScript to be more like something that they're comfortable with or more like something that they want to work with. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. I think that we're actually pretty conservative uh, with what we add to the language. We've gotten faster, but we mostly implement uh, a large portion of what we're putting into the language are helper methods and things to like make things easier for programmers. Um, yeah, but if, if there's more questions there, I'm happy to answer that. What are my thoughts for on TypeScript? I think TypeScript is a great compiled to JavaScript language. Uh, but I guess that the question might also be, what are my thoughts on types? Um, so TypeScript is interesting because if I remember correctly, TypeScript's types are not types that help the implementation. They're more about helping the programmer 
and they're not 100 they're, they're sort of somewhere in that area and um, the idea of bringing types to JavaScript has been discussed it has been brought to committee it has been rejected and uh, it could be brought up again, well rejected things don't get rejected from committee they get blocked um, and one of the things I could block something is like, well, I don't think this belongs in JavaScript. So that was sort of the argument because, uh, you know, I didn't present one thing uh, while we were talking here. And uh, that thing that I didn't present is uh, another thing that I was going to present at committee. It didn't get presented at committee, but it's this at the bottom, cognitive dimensions of notation. This is a presentation about a framework for evaluating features in a language. And this is work that I've been doing with uh, Dr. Feline Hermans from Leiden University. Cognitive dimensions of notation are a way, it's, it's, uh, it's a vocabulary, it's a framework for describing how a feature impacts a language, how a feature impacts uh, information notation set. And uh, what, this, uh, what this covers is like different aspects, like different ways that a new feature can pull a language in terms of its usability. And usability is the key word here. Feline did some really great work uh, on Excel as a user interface um, and uh, using this framework in order to describe it. And uh, what she ended up with is a spider graph that shows how different things impacted the programmer's mental model, uh, which, when, which were um, more beneficial given one design and less beneficial given another design. So uh, when we talk about types, what that is is about reducing something called error proneness, according to this framework. It makes programmers less likely to make a mistake. But when you reduce error proneness, what you do is you take away from another thing in the language, which is provisionality, the ability to quickly sketch out an idea or think something through. So this is sort of a debate that's sort of raging, like, should we make the language less error prone? Should we make the language um, more provisional or vice versa? And at the moment, we're on the side of it's, it should be more provisional because the goal is that it's easy to write. Uh, this is, I think, a really interesting framework. It hasn't been adopted by the committee. I didn't have a chance to present this yet, but it is something that's been around since 1989, and it might be interesting for you to take a look at as well. So, I love that JS has lexical closures. Um, gives you the power to have private variables. I'm wondering if we're making the special syntax for private variables instead of making syntactic sugar for prototype functions closing over constructor local variables. Um, so, uh, I'm not the best person to answer that question. I'm sorry, it's a really good question, but I'm not the best person to answer it. Um, how about in my next stream, I'm going to save that question and come up with a really good answer for you on Friday. <laughs> Sorry, that's really unsatisfying. <laughs> um, all right, uh, I'm sorry that that last one, I, I, I just can't think of anything intelligent to say there, and I don't want to say something wrong, so. Um, what are my thoughts on Facebook's flow typing systems con contrasting with TypeScript? Huh. So I've worked with both TypeScript and Flow. Uh, so a little bit of my history. I used to be a JavaScript developer. I'm, uh, I transitioned to the SpiderMonkey team because I, I wanted to work on the standard and I'm particularly interested in uh, how the language grows from, so I used to work on DevTools. I'm really interested in how people express their intent in code. And uh, TypeScript and Flow, they're both really great tools about expressing yourself in code. Uh, and again, we can talk about error proneness and provisionality and everything like this. Flow, from my perspective, is a bit more permissive than TypeScript. And that comes with benefits and, um, and um, drawbacks as well. Um, I don't prefer one over the other, to tell you the truth. And it's been half a year since I wrote any JavaScript, and it's been <laughs> quite some time since I wrote any TypeScript. So I don't have a preference. I think that these, the fact that the way that these tools work, I think is spectacular. 
uh, compile to JavaScript languages, I think, are a great way to do what you want on the web and make the web work the way that you want without necessarily relying on JavaScript being what you want. It takes pressure off of JavaScript to stretch and be all of these different languages at once, which I think will reach a breaking point at some point. And it allows you to do exactly what you want. So I think those are both great. Flow is more permissive. TypeScript is also great. It implements some stuff faster than we do. I believe they already got decorators, uh, even though it's a previous version of the specification. But you can already use them there, which is great. So, um, so this is going to be the last question that I take, which is, is the stream schedule available anywhere? Yes, it is. Uh, it is available on uh, the Mozilla developer portal with a description of what's coming up. So today is June 9th and we're talking about uh, the TC39 meeting that was last week. And what's, actually I'm gonna just paste this directly for you folks so that you can see it. Um, the next one on June 12th, we'll be picking up the work that we did the week before, the week before the TC39 meeting and moving forward with fixing uh, web compatibility issues in SpiderMonkey. And we're going to actually continue directly from the increment decrement thing um, that we worked on last time. And we're going to keep digging into that problem and learn more about that problem and fix more bugs. That's the plan. All right, I think this is a good place to leave it off. Um, let me know how this format is working, how the time is working, how everything is working. I'm really curious how people are responding to this, so please let me know. Uh, there, um, Twitter is a great way to get in touch with me. The uh, suggestions box is a really great way to get in touch with me. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you here next, not next week, but on Friday this week, where I keep working on that bug and let's see where this goes. Bye everybody.